Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster, and today, oh, today, we are covering Maison Martin Margiela Spring Summer 1997. This is one of the single most important metaphors, imagery, pieces, single pictures in the Maison's history. We are going to have a gigantic all rise, but not until the time is right. Here we have a showroom setting instead of a traditional runway show. The Maison has done this a number of different times. They also created a on-the-street short film for this collection, and the showroom itself was decorated with lots of artificial sunflowers. It's important to note here that this is one of a two-part presentation, and we'll see in the next episode why it is so important that these presentations be lumped together and thought of as a single piece. In the showroom, they played Muzak, which is like that atmosphere-enhancing elevator music type stuff. The history of Muzak is actually a pretty keen metaphor for the Maison's work generally. The original tech that led to Muzak was created in the 19 teens so that stores and public places could have some form of environmental kind of atmospheric music but without having to have a full-on radio installed because at the time radios were very large, they were extremely expensive, and they were really difficult to maintain. What Muzak did is it allowed them to just technologically wire in only the necessary pieces so that they could have exactly what they wanted. Much like how the Maison kind of stops things part of the way through or only takes in like the necessary pieces, they leave things kind of undone, but the goals are still achieved. Muzak was also accused of being a brainwashing tool in the 1950s, which is hilarious and also fits in really well with the surrealistic elements that the Maison does generally. Because like, imagine walking into this space, cheesy 70s mall music plays everywhere, and then then a woman walks up to you cosplaying as a vintage dress form and offers you a solo cup of red wine. And suddenly we're in a David Lynch film. Hey team, do you know how much these videos make on average on YouTube? About $30. I am only able to do this because of the people who support the channel through Patreon. And if you love this content, you should sign up for the Patreon. I am also, big news, so thrilled to say that I am supported by Audible now. And if you would like a free month and a free audiobook, you just go to audibletrial.com slash blissfoster and sign up. There are so many good fashion books on Audible, it is insane. Right now I'm rereading Amatura, which is the history of Japanese fashion. It starts us at World War II and it brings us all the way up to like Capital and Visvim and Bape. It's outstanding. Click the link in the description and get it or any audiobook for free. Okay, so we're gonna cover this show a little bit differently than we've covered other Maison Martin Margiela shows. The real key to this show, and really to, it could be argued, to Martin's career generally, is the Stockman jacket. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about why this piece, symbolically, is so important to the story of the Maison. Let's move around here a little bit. In previous shows, the Maison questioned the fashion system by taking old garments and then recontextualizing them into new fashion. Here and now in the present, that isn't really a novel concept. Everybody thrifts, but in Paris specifically, this was a revolutionary concept, right? So we've covered that for the entire series. But here in this season, we see a notable flip on that concept. We do see Martin reaching back in order to recontextualize, but it's something from his past and his present the social relationships of production. Da, comrade, it is time to talk about labor in fashion. So there were actually two designers who were both talking about this crucial issue of women's bodies' relationship with their clothes in the same season of Paris Fashion Week. Martin Margiela and Grandma Ray Kawakubo. Spring Summer 1997 was also the season that we were blessed with the seminal Comme des Garcons runway show, Body Meets Dress, Dress Meets Body, or as it is more affectionately known, the Lumps and Bumps collection. Grandma Ray's methods are wildly unorthodox. There literally is not another designer like her. In a rare moment of transparency, Ray gave a statement about this collection saying, quote, I want to rethink the body so the body and the dress become one, end quote. And then on the other hand, Martin was exploring this same idea through the concept of production in fashion. And the symbol that he used, the metaphor, in order to talk about production is an object that is necessary for the production of all fashion. The dress form. No way. Nosebleed check. Stand by. And we're back. In fashion theory, there's often this discussion of subject and object. The subject is you, me. It's a person with a body that has to wear clothes in order to live and function in society. Because we do, after all, live in a society. The object, on the other hand, is 
clothing, so subject and object. But there's this disconnect between subject and object. Have you ever wondered why so many clothes just don't seem to fit right? All of us know what our size is, but there is this inherent tension between our bodies and the clothes of the world. Marjola is attempting through this collection to unite the subject and the object through the social relationships of production. In the brilliant book, Fashion in Materialism, the author, Lemon, says, quote, the production of the object through labor is defined as a conscious process for social change, end quote. Martin is talking about social change, and when he says that, he He's talking about the change between the relationship that women have with their bodies and the clothes that they put on them. Let's define some terms real quick so we're all on the same page. The social relationships of production are really not that complex. All this is doing is it's asking the question, are women empowered by wearing clothes that are never designed for them in the first place, or do women suffer under a system of power involving the clothes that they wear. What is this system of power that Margiela is speaking to? I'm bored, let's move. 20th century fashion kind of discovered women's bodies. We moved from a period of heavy augmentation of women's bodies into one where it seemed better because we were more appreciative of their natural form, right? Because before, say, 1920, there were all these artificial scaffolding and body parts like peignets and bustles. The idea of switching from that to clothing that actually acknowledges the natural female body seemed Seems like a really great piece of progress. But is it that great or is it just different? Because the rise of off-the-rack clothes, Pret-a-Porter, meant that everyone's clothes were now being standardized into sizing rather than the clothes being made for the individual like they were before this change in fashion. I believe that this show and the Comme des Garçons show are both reacting to the heroin chic movement in the 90s. One of the primary pillars of that movement was headed up by a young man from Austin, Texas named Thomas Carlyle Ford. Tom Ford's first collection at Gucci was not Fall Winter 1995, but that was for sure the collection that put him on the map. This collection, along with other cultural hallmarks of the heroin chic movement, like this Calvin Klein ad, were pitching women's bodies in a new light. Tom called it sexy. He said it was a rejection of the retro chic that had been so dominant for the first half of the 90s, and so he, he sent models down the runway and pretty literally redefined what sexy meant in the 1990s. And that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But this new brand of sexiness was most dominantly defined by depictions of women who were incredibly, and in many cases, unhealthily skinny. The low-cut pants and the tight tailoring in the thighs reinforced this. Okay, so here's how clothes get made. I promise this is all connected. When clothes moved more towards ready to wear and this became a more universal system, clothing adopted this idea of sizes. It's a couple of different shapes that in theory will fit everyone, but that's not true. The object that you're meant to wear, clothing, is created using another object, a dress form, that is not you. Then your clothes get made and they get sent to stores where you have to then buy and wear them. So in this whole system, you, the subject, your literal body, you are the last person to have any kind of say in what's happening in this process. It's an object created based on another object that the subject is just supposed to accept. You will eat what I've cooked for you. But that doesn't, I mean, first of all, it's really unfair, but also it makes no sense at all, especially if this is what fashion was moving towards. If the trend at the time is these super low cut pants and these tightly tailored thighs, then there's no way for the subject to get what they actually need. It's an object based on another object that's based off of an idea of a woman's body that hardly even exists out in the natural world. At a minimum, our body should be in some kind of conversation with the clothes that we're wearing, but this is not a conversation. This is the tyranny of an object dominating the subject. So Martin and Ray address this problem in different ways. Ray found fashion to be too limiting in general. That's kind of her MO. She chose to free the clothes from the body in this collection. Much like the augmented silhouettes of the past, she proposed new shapes for the body and then created the final result where the dress and the body, the subject and the object, become one new thing together. She freed the clothes and united them with the body. Martin, on the other hand, saw that women were trapped and in servitude to their clothes. By creating objects that were subservient to the subject and uniting the two symbolically by, by making the person a dress form, we're to understand that this is a union, he named that problem. And the dress form itself, I don't think it's a stretch to say, is a symbol for feminine oppression. And they broke it. They made the dress form subservient to the woman's body, and they even split the thing. The dress form jackets were often worn open. 
with the model almost emerging out of it from the system that was holding her body hostage. So as if that isn't enough, they didn't stop. The next step was they made clothes. We've already talked about how Martin has been taking more and more of an interest in couture processes, and for this season, he actually went back to school and took a couture draping class from the former atelier head at Givenchy. In the documentary, in his own words, Martin specifies that he wanted originally just to make a couture collection, but when they finished a lot of the dresses, he looked at them and said, this, this just looks too much like just a regular couture collection. So he looked back through his notes, his pictures, trying to figure out what to do, and he saw the photos of his own couture exercises, these draping lessons that he went through, and he said, this is it right here. We'll, we'll show him the process. And that's the signature Margiela move, right, is, is we show the process. Just like in showing the process of production in this collection uniquely, he went back and he showed the process of what makes clothes so great. The biggest one so far, all rise. So the women in the collection wore the stockman jackets and the couture sketches were attached. You may be seated or remain standing if you're just too excited. But for the first time, the stockman object wouldn't control the woman's body. The woman's body would now be the basis on which the clothes were made. Not an object built on an object, but an object made for its subject. A new kind of couture. It's no coincidence that the stockman jackets say semi-couture. That's usually where the brand name stockman would go, but here it's a wordplay. Haute couture means high fashion, semi-couture means half fashion. Margiela is proposing a new philosophy for fashion design. The brilliant Caroline Evans observes in her seminal book, Fashion at the Edge, quote, he recreated the tailor's dummy as a linen waistcoat so that the foundation became underwear, the body became the dress. There is so much more to cover in this show. If you want to watch the full extended, really the complete episodes of the Margiela series, got to get on that Patreon. It's just $3 a month and you're supporting the channel. You're making it where all of this can happen. One of the Margiela episodes will always be an exclusive Patreon only episode. Click the link that is somewhere on your screen right now to join that very Patreon. And hey, I mean, come on, why would you not want a free audiobook? Audibletrial.com slash blissfoster. The link is down in the description. Just go and get a free audiobook. Like, why not? When you do that, you are directly supporting the channel. Personally, fashion audiobooks have changed my entire career here. It allowed me to continue learning about fashion while I was driving and doing housework and mindlessly scrolling on my phone. I am in a constant state of learning about the industry that I love so much. My affection for you is unwavering. Goodbye.